Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. We are on the part one, the Yoga of Divine Works, chapter one, the four instruments. The four instruments are Shastra, the science, Abhyasa, the effort, teacher, the guru, Kala, time. And uh, we have completed Shastra and Abhyasa, the science and the effort that is required. In the previous episode, number 36, we touched upon, we have covered the personal effort that is required and uh, three stages of the yoga in which we cannot skip them, we cannot leapfrog, we cannot start with the last. We need to go through the process of purifying, liberating, transforming ourselves so that the dangers of the yoga can be eliminated. And now we are starting on the portion on the teacher of integral yoga, the guru, the third instrument. Link to this chapter is there in the description. Please follow that if you are not yet familiar with it. We are on the 17th paragraph. As the Supreme Shastra of the Integral Yoga is the eternal Veda, secret in the heart of every man, so its supreme guide and teacher is the inner guide, the world teacher, Jagat Guru, secret within us. This is huge. This is very, very central to integral yoga. The knowledge, all knowledge is already there within us. The Veda that is secret within us. The same is also our inner guide. It reveals little by little who had been guiding from within. And who is also a world teacher because this divine guide is seated in the heart of all creatures. And when someone is ready, you begin to recognize that guidance. So the supreme teacher of integral yoga is this inner guide seated within. Who is at once our personal inner guide as well as the world teacher who is teaching, molding everyone according to the capacity of the instrument. So as the supreme shastra of the integral yoga is the eternal Veda secret in the heart of every man, so its supreme guide and teacher is the inner guide, the world teacher, Jagat Guru, secret within us. And we do not sufficiently recognize it in our early stages of yeah, the sadhana. We are seeking without necessarily knowing. First, we are seeking knowledge. And we also try this or that practice. We still find that things are pretty much clumsy. It's not working out. And then at one point, we also begin to really search for a teacher. And usually searching for a teacher outside. But the teacher is already seated within. Earlier you recognize, the better it is. To know the true guide seated within and guiding who had been shaping your life to recognize it is a crucial step. It is he who destroys our darkness by the resplendent light of his knowledge. That light becomes within us the increasing glory of his own self-revelation. The words used are very glorious and bright, resplendent. 
light of his knowledge. When we look inward, we see a confused mass of thoughts, emotions, sensations, energies, all that flowing in and out. But in the process of yoga, when we calm down, when we quieten, when we begin to get the sense of the inner guide, the inner process of guidance is of revelation. The awakening ray coming from inside, entering the mind and revealing into the mind as knowledge, entering the heart and bringing the wave of joy and perception of the beloved, entering the vitality and bringing the dynamic will, entering the very physical substance and making it light and healthy. And in that, there is a revelation that pours in, that increases with time and eventually becoming the resplendent radiance of our being. It's almost like sun within, a luminous sun. Therefore, Vedic Rishis always, in a symbolic language, spoke about the series of dawns, resplendent waves of awakening of the light within revealing itself. It is all about preparing the mind to receive, preparing the instruments to receive, the mind, the heart, the energy, so that they can receive the resplendent radiance of our true self seated within. So it is he who destroys our darkness. He is that inner guide who is secretly guiding us from within, who destroys our darkness. Darkness is of ignorance, mind groping in ignorance. That is the darkness. And that is what the symbolic dawn is all about. The darkness of our lower nature, mind of night in obscurity, groping for light through its little sensory knowledge. That is what gets destroys, that he who destroys our darkness, that darkness gets removed, destroyed, when the rising of the sun happens. The inner light reveals increasingly and the more you surrender to it, the more radiant it becomes, the more powerful it becomes, and it destroys all the darkness. It is he who destroys our darkness. Therefore, Guru is also referred as a dispeller of darkness. By the resplendent light of his knowledge, now, this knowledge is not a bookish knowledge. This is the self-existent knowledge that is within us, which radiates from within. That light becomes within us the increasing glory of his own self-revelation, the glory of self-revelation, the Supreme Being revealing and its ananda of becoming, playing through you. Revealing in your thoughts, in your emotions, in your actions. And you become the witness of that resplendent play of the Supreme Being seated within you, as well as seated in all beings. It's the Jagad Guru, the world teacher, to whom you surrender to. He discloses progressively in us his own nature of freedom, bliss, love, power, immortal being. So this inner guide discloses progressively his own nature of freedom, bliss, love, power, and immortal being. Immortal being. We have our mortal part of us, construct, the biological construct, this body construct. And within that body construct, there is a habitual bundle of emotions, memories, thoughts, ideas, constituting our outer ego personality. These are transient forms, mortal layers of our being. And deep within is the immortal, the axis of eternity within us 
the center of eternity. There is an immortal being within us and its power and its bliss. That's because the very nature of this immortal being is bliss, Satchidananda, blissfully conscious existence, immortal, always perfect. And this is where the absolute freedom is. So freedom, bliss, love, power, immortal being. These are the gifts that we receive from within. The deepest depth of our being, that's where the hidden secret of love and delight is there within us, waiting to reveal and radiantly reveal and resplendence of that radiance, the glory of our true being, awaiting the discovery. And this he discloses progressively in us. His own nature, this is the nature, very perfection that is already existing within us. His own nature of freedom, bliss, love, power, immortal being. He sets above us his divine example as our ideal and transforms the lower existence into a reflection of that which it contemplates. So this inner guide progressively reveals the possibility, sets above us his divine example as our ideal. Divine example. We will be drawn to the divine light and divine examples in the world. The divine manifests in people. And one or other degree of perfection, that revelation, we will recognize. And see what a glory that is. And we will see the examples of his action in the world. And an inner image of the divine gets formed and revealed within us. As Ishta Devata, as the divine form, as an example, as our ideal, and transforms the lower existence into a reflection of that which it contemplates. There is a reflection in the lower nature, in our existing inner nature, in our mind, in our heart, there is a reflection that we receive, a gradual formation of the ideal. And that becomes our heart's contemplation, our mind's continuous dwelling. And it is through that dwelling, through that holding, it progressively manifests and reveals and you become that which you contemplate. So he sets above us his divine example as our ideal. Now, that constructing that ideal, if we try to do it with our mental effort and mental will, it will be very narrow and limited. It will get revealed. But there is a process where we go through reading this or that, studying scriptures, studying books, reading masters, listening to masters, teachers, teachings, all that are part of the journey because our intellect, which is ignorant, has to absorb the knowledge. It gathers a lot, but truly the shaping happens from within. When it gets revealed, what gets picked up from all the experiences of the world and how it gets shaped depends upon the inner guide and guide chooses and shapes the example for you, the ideal for you. And the more you recognize the way it is getting revealed and shaped, the more you can surrender to it and contemplate on it. The more you contemplate, the more it gets formed with revealed clarity, lucid precision. And the, as the clarity grows, its dynamism grows. And eventually, you move towards the realization of that which you're contemplating within you. So he sets above us his divine example as our ideal and transforms the lower existence into a reflection of that which it contemplates. 
by the inpouring of his own influence and presence into us. He enables the individual to attain, to identify with the universal and transcendent. So the one who is presiding within us, the inner guide, though there is an individual poised to this inner guide, there is also the universal poise of that inner guide and transcendent status of that inner guide. So this inner wisdom gradually nudges us to move from the realization as at an individual level to move towards universal and to the transcendent. And this is done by the inpouring of his own influence and presence into us. The inner guide would pour the light and force into our instrumental nature. So in pouring, in pouring, what starts off as a tickle of a little ray of awakening begins to become an outpouring or an inpouring of that light and force and ananda and love. And in the Vedas, we see the seven rivers flowing, mighty streams of higher consciousness through the yogins of the ancient India. They have recorded their experiences. And it is possible even the new seekers to open to that inpouring of that divine light and force and love and delight into our instrumental nature, which transforms it. And it is not our individual tiny little will and knowledge that will enable it. All that it can do is seize upon all the outgoing energies and its narrow workings and turn them towards recognizing this inner guide and be receptive to it so that we become increasingly purified and transformed and that resplendent light and joy pours and pours and pours and transforms. And he enables the individual being to attain to identity with the universal and transcendent. And it is this inner guide who will enable us to break out of the narrow molds of the ego and open to the universal and transcendent levels of our deepest, highest truth of our being. The divine being revealing through this journey. What is his method and his system? He has no method and every method. The inner guide. How does the inner guide operationalize his teaching and his transformative process? His system is a natural organization of the highest processes and movements of which the nature is capable. His system is a natural organization of the highest processes and movements of which the nature is capable. Natural organization. Our mind is an organizer. It categorizes experiences, classifies, groups them, makes sense out of it. And it's a very nature of the mind. And there is a mental way of organizing things. And if we look at our physical nature and ecosystem, it is pre-mental state. And yet it is a very well-organized ecosystem, well-harmonized, a profound intelligence is operating in it. So there is a rational way the mind can organize and there is a pre-rational way the nature, the ecosystem organizes itself. And we can also say there's a transrational, a spiritual way. The divine wisdom organizes things. Here, the inner guide organizes things, not necessarily according to our rational, linear way of understanding things. There's a natural way of 
organizing. His system is a natural organization of the highest processes and movements of which the nature is capable. There is a manifest nature, our individual nature, and there is a collective nature. And it has multiple movements that are happening in which there is a highest movement that is possible. So the guide uses this highest possible movements and organizes things. Here I would like to clarify the word he and his. Sri was writing synthesis of yoga at a time when he was very deeply into the sadhana of Sri Krishna and Kali. And he used to refer largely as he, he, he as the inner guide and his sadhana he received from Sri Krishna. Later, after the 20s, after the arrival of the mother, he would gradually shift towards she and even the inner guide itself. It is she who is seated within. So there is a shift in vocabulary that takes place. The divine is neither male nor female. Depending upon the sadhana and the ishta devata with which through whom you approach that which is eternal and timeless, transcendent, universal and individual at the same time, accordingly this vocabulary would change. So here he is, Sri Aurobindo is referring to say he and in later books you will say she, the one who is within each creature and guiding. So just keep that in mind so we can avoid the unnecessary confusion in the future. What is his method and his system? He has no method and every method. His system is a natural organization of the highest processes and movements, highest processes and movements of which the nature is capable. In the evolutionary process, nature has developed life on earth and then mind on earth and organized all that and the evolution of the mind, the progressive mind as we learned in the introduction, all that is happening and that's the highest available instrumentation. This is already organized. So the inner guide is not rejecting any of this, uses them and refines them, organizes them, utilizes them in the journey of the soul and seizing of the ego and turning this to recognize the divine presence. Applying themselves even to the pettiest details and to the actions the most insignificant in their appearance, with as much care and thoughtfulness, with as much care and thoroughness as the greatest, they in the end lift all into the light and transform all. So this divine wisdom, the divine guide who is seated within us, who is guiding us moment to moment, everything. Nothing is insignificant in this journey. Every little gesture that you make, every little movement of thought, every little activity that you do, 24 hour basis, 365 days, whether you are cleaning your room, organizing your desktop, organizing your files, or organizing your wardrobe, choosing your clothes, buying something, every little thing matters to the divine. As much as you're conceiving the large movements, you're having your 10 year plan, or social transformation plan, or whatever be the grand idea that you have. Grandest to the tiniest. Everything is equal to this inner guide. And inner guide is nudging moment to moment, second to second, to do the right thing at the right time. And learning to discern that inner guidance and it uses our existing developed capacities the way it stands organized. 
So applying themselves even to the pettiest details and to the actions, the most insignificant and insignificant in their appearance, with as much care and thoroughness as to the greatest, they, in the end, lift all into the light and transform all. Everything is lifted up. Our mental nature is lifted up. Our vital nature is lifted up. Our physical nature is lifted up. So the teaching methods and systems, they pay attention to the minutest, to the grandest, and lift them up all towards their higher possibility. For in his yoga, there is nothing too small to be used and nothing too great to be attempted. So nothing too small, nothing too great. Like in Sri Aurobindo's case, when he came to India, very first thing that he took up was the liberation of the country. Such a massive idea to liberate a nation that was enslaved, colonized by an outside power and to shake that up. And that was the kind of mission, the project he was given. And afterwards, after that mission reached certain level of intensity, he was given the next mission of the entire humanity in a devolutionary crisis and earth consciousness shifting into a whole new level. That's like a collective evolution, such a massive attempt. So nothing is too small when the divine is the guide. In his yoga, there is nothing too small to be used and nothing too great to be attempted. As the servant and disciple of the master, capital M, master, has no business with pride or egoism because all is done for him from above. So also he has no right to despond because of his personal deficiencies or the stumblings of his nature. So since that omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent divine master is in charge of yoga, you don't have to worry about the deficiencies and limitations of your nature. As beautiful sloka says, Mukam karoti vachalam pangum lenghayate kirim yat kripatamaham vande paramananda madhavam. Even the one who is Dumb will speak eloquently, lame will climb mountains. Such is the glory of that supreme delight, Madhava, the master. So you don't take any pride with egoism, all that getting done through you, nor you despond. You feel desperate because you see the inefficiencies, incapacities, limitations in you. You don't worry. Because the one who has chosen is chosen by the Absolute. It is that which has the almighty power. Instrument is small, incapable, a tiny little pen, but in the hands of a great master within, who is the world master, Jagat Guru, everything becomes possible. As the servant and disciple of the master has no business with pride or egoism because all is done for him from above. So these are two poises. One is inside, seated within. The divine guide seated within, in the depth of the heart. Another poise is above, the eternal self that is above. And everything is done from above and transmitted through the one who is seated in the heart. So also he has no right to despond because of his personal deficiencies or the stumblings of his nature. For the force that works in him is impersonal or superpersonal and infinite. So the divine wisdom and power and light that is on one hand impersonal 
but also another way to use it is it is super personal and infinite. It knows every tiny little thought that is streaming through you, every little wave of emotion, every sensation, every movement of everyone and everything. It is omnipresent, omniscient and guiding. It's just that our tiny little narrow ego doesn't know. That doesn't make the divine wisdom not to know. It is when the ego recognizes the inner guide, the universal teacher, it learns to surrender and your yoga become more effective and efficient. And you hand over the responsibility of yoga to that. This is where the transformation becomes rapid. For the force that works in him is impersonal or superpersonal and infinite. That makes everything possible. The full recognition of this inner guide, master of the yoga, lord, light, enjoyer, and goal of all sacrifice and effort is of the utmost importance in the path of integral perfection. This is the most important thing in this path, path of integral perfection. Perfection is possible only in some instruments, say mental perfection. And integral perfection is when the entire nature, mental nature, vital nature, physical nature, everything is perfected. So on the path of that integral perfection, this inner guide become absolutely central. If you are not seeking an integral perfection, if you are seeking only a liberation from the limitations of the ego construct into the transcendent, then it is not so critical. Whereas the transformation and perfection of all the lower nature requires this inner guide, the Lord, the word that he is using is master of yoga, he is the master of yoga of nature that is unfolding, he is the Lord, he is the light and enjoyer, the one who is enjoying dancing through the entire creation, he is the master, enjoyer, he is also the word related to the, when we hear the word Bhagavan, it comes from the word Bhaga, also related to Bhoga, the enjoyment. Bhagavan, Bhagavati, Bhoga, enjoyment, the one who is the enjoyer, because the very nature of the divine consciousness is delight and love. Who is the enjoyer, and goal of all sacrifice and effort. Sacrifice, it's a key word. We will be coming back to it again and again in the coming chapters, especially in the Yoga of Divine Works. It's a profound concept, yajna. Goal of all sacrifice and effort is of the utmost importance in the path of integral perfection. Let me read once again, crucial statement here. The full recognition of this inner guide, master of the yoga, lord, light, enjoyer, and goal of all sacrifice and effort is of the utmost importance in the path of integral perfection. The divine enjoys, is not only the master of our yoga, who is also the enjoying through us, the world action in the world, and it is immaterial whether he is first seen as an impersonal wisdom, love and power behind all things. An absolute manifesting in the relative and attracting it as one's highest self and the highest self of all. As a divine person within us and in the world. In one of his or her numerous forms and names, or as the ideal which the mind conceives. The whole spectrum Sri Aurobindo is giving here. Now, how do you conceive the inner guide, the master of the yoga? 
it is immaterial whether he is first seen as an impersonal wisdom like various spiritual traditions will not acknowledge any personal relationship or form they would only speak about the impersonal wisdom no form it has to be impersonal and that's the way one relates to the inner guide that's how many schools of yoga approach and that's one of the approach as a impersonal wisdom or other schools as love when it comes to love there comes all the forms of relationship or power behind all things as the god who is presiding over things and there are hundreds and hundreds of forms of the divine or as an absolute manifesting the relative and attracting it philosophers refers to as that as the absolute capital a absolute that's a vocabulary of the philosopher the absolute and relative the relative is the manifest world in which we individuals exist absolute is all containing and transcending everything and the source of everything and that not only manifest but also attracts the individual towards the absolute so an absolute manifesting in the relative and attracting it as one's highest self and the highest self of all so we can also conceive the inner guide as one's own highest self or also the highest self of all in existence all people all life all existence the highest self of all these are all possibilities as the divine person within us and in the world this is another possibility as the divine person within us and in the world in one of his or her numerous forms and names so in india we have lalita sahasranama vishnu sahasranama these are all the recognition of the endless variety through which the divine manifest and infinite flavors of the divine expression in the world and historically recorded and acknowledged through various sadhaks who found these doorways to enter into the infinite and eternalize those names and forms for the coming generations whether you see it as impersonal or personal and within personal whether it as male or as female or within that subdivisions all the possibilities are open to us or as the ideal which the mind conceives that's another possibility human mind can skip all the dimensions of the being whether it is impersonal being personal being male female all that forget about all that mind can also conceive the inner guide as the ideal our mind is an idealist seeker after perfection so it can conceive as an ideal that seeks perfection in the world harmony in the world beauty in the world all that are possible in this approach so it's a big line let's read once again it is immaterial whether he is first seen as an impersonal wisdom love and power behind all be all things as an absolute manifesting in the relative and attracting it as one's highest self and the highest self of all as a divine person within us and in the world in one of his or her numerous forms and names or as the ideal which the mind conceives in the end we perceive that he is all and more than all these things together that's the point for our human communication this vocabulary become necessary practical devices so whether it is called he she it that absolute void emptiness doesn't matter what 
end of the day, this transcends everything. But in order to communicate, we have to use one or other name and form. This is a typical human need. But the source, the divine transcends all forms, all names, everything. So in the end, we perceive that he is all and more than all these things together. The mind's door of entry to the conception of him must necessarily vary according to the past evolution and present nature. So mind's door of entry to the conception. Human mind has to have some or other conception. And human mind is evolving. Collective mind is evolving. And every cycle of civilization, human mind has to conceive that absolute, the divine, one way or other. Therefore, the numerous conceptions we have in the past. And these conceptions, depending upon the past evolution, of the individual and the collective. So the mind's door of entry to the conception of him must necessarily vary according to the past evolution and present nature. What is the current present nature? And what was the past formations? All that become the conditions in which the conception of the inner guide the way individual human mind would conceive the divine will vary. And we should be open to the infinite variation and variety of conceptions. And that brings tremendous freedom to the seeker. You're not bound by any one name or form. This is where Integral Yoga of Sri Aurobindo opens to the infinite possibility for every seeker. You're not going to bind yourself to any one name and form. Because that which is absolute is infinite, eternal, timeless. And it takes on names and forms according to the evolutionary stage of the society and the individual. This inner guide is often veiled at first by the very intensity of our personal effort and by the ego's preoccupation with itself and its aims. Now these are the two reasons how the inner guide remains veiled. First is the very intensity of our personal effort because we are experiencing effort as I am searching for something that I am not able to reach, not able to find. And there is a personal effort, personal will and sense of me doing it, me organizing things. That prevents the recognition of the inner guide. Second is ego's preoccupation with itself and its aims. Even when turn towards spiritual journey begins, it is the ego still the dominant personality. So it has its own conceptions about what you are up to, what you are into. And particularly in the early stages, you don't necessarily recognize that what is unfolding in your life is actually a spiritual awakening and a quest. And it takes time because ego is identified with the external world, its values, its systems, its objectives, its goals. Therefore, it takes time for the ego to unplug from all that and begin to recognize the inner guide. So two things, one is this personal intense effort, the other is the very nature of the ego to be occupied with itself and its conventional aims. So this inner guide is often veiled at first by the very intensity of our personal effort 
and by the ego's preoccupation with itself and its aims. As we gain in clarity and the turmoil of egoistic effort gives place to a calmer self-knowledge, we recognize the source of the growing light within us. Keyword here is calmer self-knowledge. Our general tendency, the ego and its occupation with the world and worldly desires, ambitions and goals is generally a restless activity, a compulsive restless activity. Because of that restlessness and the whole internal mental noise, we are not able to come in touch with the inner guide. Certain calmness is required. And it is in that calmer inner self-knowledge, the source begins to get revealed. We are beginning to get a glimpse of the way the inner guide works. But it requires certain inner quietude, inner calmness. So as we gain in clarity and the turmoil of egoistic effort, the turmoil of egoistic effort, even if it is an effort towards spiritual realization, when it is an ego-driven effort, it has its turmoil, it has its drama, gives place to calmer self-knowledge. We recognize the source of the growing light within us. The light within is growing. Inner self, that inner guide, is often associated with light. And the very experience of light getting revealed from within or light pouring down from above, these are common aspects of spiritual experiences. So here it is, the growing light within we begin to recognize. We recognize it retrospectively as we realize how all our obscure and conflicting movements have been determined towards an end that we only now begin to perceive. How even before our entrance into the path of yoga, the evolution of our life has been designedly led towards its turning point. So, there is a larger intention, a designed effort by the greater wisdom, organizing your life, shaping your life, even before you woke up to the possibility of yoga. It was already working, but without necessarily you being aware of it, and you're stumbling through your life, and at one point you begin to suspect there is something of a spiritual nature unfolding, you need to focus on that, and you get clarity on the spiritual path, and you begin to recognize the divine guidance, and the more you recognize, and when you look back into the past, the entire life journey, you can see there was a hidden secret wisdom shaping you, bringing you to this point of awakening. And that will become evident in retrospect. We recognize it retrospectively as we realize how all our obscure and conflicting movements obscure and conflicting movements. Often, many things that happen in our life in the process of unfolding is in conflict with each other. And that turns you, that wakes you up, have been determined towards an end that we only now begin to perceive. How, even before our entrance into the path of yoga, the evolution of our life has been designedly led towards its turning point. Designedly. There was a design behind it. 
and you begin to notice the pattern, intention, how you are getting shaped. For now we begin to understand the sense of our struggles and efforts, successes and failures. So in that retrospective view, we will see things in the right order where our struggles and efforts and successes and failures, everything was part of the shaping. But while going through the shaping, we tend to judge them ignorantly with a limited perspective. But what appeared as failure later, you would see, was a step on the way of building you, shaping you. For now we begin to understand the sense of our struggles and efforts, successes and failures. At last, we are able to seize the meaning of our ordeals and sufferings and can appreciate the help that was given us by all that hurt and resisted and the utility of our very falls and stumblings, very utility of our falls and stumblings. At last we are able to seize. It takes some journey to get that vantage point to look back. At last we are able to seize the meaning of our ordeals and sufferings the meaning of our ordeals and sufferings, what appeared as a random sequence of events unfolding <clears throat> without a particular comprehension of what is unfolding, they all will reveal and can appreciate the help that was given us. There was a hidden hand helping, which we will be able to recognize by all that hurt and resisted. So in the process of journey, many things hurt us. Many things stand on the way as a resistance. All that behind it, you will see the shaping hand and the utility of our very falls and stumblings. At last, we are able to seize the meaning of our ordeals and sufferings and can appreciate the help that was given us by all that hurt and resisted and the utility of our falls and stumblings. We recognize this divine leading afterwards, not retrospectively, but immediately, in the molding of our thoughts by a transcendent seer, in our will and actions by an all-embracing power, of our emotional life, by an all-attracting and all-assimilating bliss and love. You see the structure of this line. First is like our thoughts, mind, mind space, getting molded by a seer. There is an inner witness who is waking up behind us, who is shaping thoughts, directing thoughts. That is one thing that we will be recognized, not in retrospect, but in real time. There is an intervention from behind, the seer behind the seeing. Like Kena Upanishad would say, Keneshitam patati prekshitam manaha. By, propelled by whom? My thoughts or my mind falls upon its objects. So the seer behind the seeing, seer behind the thought, we will become conscious of that presence, the seer. Here is, the seer is with capital S, the greater self standing behind our smaller frontal self. So our thoughts by a transcendent seer, that Transcendent seer is standing behind our frontal surface personality and molding the thought. 
Next is our will and actions by an all-embracing power. All-embracing power. A power that is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, operating through all. And that power is molding our will and actions. And these two will become visible. So the, the, our individual will. Third, he is taking up emotional life. Our emotional life by an all attracting, all assimilating bliss and love. So knowledge, power and love. The triple aspects of Satchidananda. So the bliss and love, power and the seer who brings the molding of our thoughts, bringing the right knowledge. And we are recognizing this in real time. So we have crossed the stage of recognizing things in retrospect. In retrospect, we see the past, recognize the molding hand. And increasingly, we become aware of the present moment in which the guidance is happening. Whether it is in the molding of thought, molding of the will and actions, or the emotional life, the emotional movement with getting attracted. It is all attracting and all assimilating bliss and love. The divine shows and present himself as the magnet that is attracting you with that profound bliss and love. So you gladly give yourself to that attraction. Gladly surrender because now you are more and more conscious of how you are getting molded, how you are getting shaped. It is no more in retrospect. It is in real time. It is happening through the mind as molding of thought. It is happening through your energy as molding of your will and action. It is happening through your heart as molding of your emotions by attracting it and all assimilating bliss and love. In love, everything gets dissolved, assimilated, harmonized, and made beautiful. We recognize this divine leading afterwards, not retrospectively, but immediately, in our molding of our thoughts by a transcendent seer, of our will and actions by an all-embracing power, of our emotional life by an all-attracting, all-assimilating bliss and love. We recognize it too in a more personal relation that from the first touch or at, la at, the, le at the last seizes us. We feel the eternal presence of a supreme master, friend, Lover, teacher, master, friend, lover, teacher. All these facets get revealed. So we recognize it too in a more personal relation. The divine, the inner guide eventually manifests in your personal relationships. That from the very, from the first touched or at the last ceased, ceases us. We feel the eternal presence of a Supreme Master, friend, lover, teacher. How we were getting picked up, drawn into a magnetic field of that Wisdom, light, beauty, delight, and all embracing power. And you see the glimpses of it in our relationships. So we recognize too in a more personal relation that from the first touched or at the last seizes us. We feel the eternal presence of a supreme master, friend lover, teacher. There is a very intimate, close relationship with the Divine. In the Bhagavad Gita, we see 
Arjuna telling Krishna and calling Krishna Sakha. And when he recognized that Sri Krishna was the divine, he was referring, I did not know, I was, I thought you were just a friend, a Sakha. Now I recognize the world teacher in you. So the divine master can present in our life as a friend. You may consider as a friend. Soon, one day, you recognize a greater wisdom that is revealing itself as a lover, as a teacher, and as a master. So the presence will draw near you, come closer and closer to you through all relationships. Even what appears to be a difficult relationship. So all are the means through which the inner guide as well as the world teacher would reach out to you and shape you. We recognize it in the essence of our being as that develops into likeness and oneness with a greater and wider existence. For we perceive that this miraculous development is not the result of our own efforts. An eternal perfection is molding us into its own image. So, in our very essence of our being, we recognize that eternal perfection shaping us, molding us, gently nudging, sweetly shaping, sometimes also with strong interventions. As that develops into likeness and oneness with a greater and wider existence. So it will also unlock you, unblock you from the narrow mold and gradually your sense of self widens, expands, embraces the wider existence. So with a greater and wider existence, for we perceive that this miraculous development is not the result of our own efforts. This will become very clear. It's not our effort. It is a greater wisdom that is at work, which is unpacking you, unfolding you, opening the petals of your heart one by one. And the radiance of that glory and light and joy and love and delight revealing itself more and more with greater purity, greater intensity and greater freedom. This will become visible. An eternal perfection is molding us into its own image, the conscious force behind existence. And that eternal perfection that is already there as a source from which everything is springing up, we begin to recognize that source as the eternal perfection is molding us into its own image and it is shaping us. One who is the Lord or Ishvara of the yogic philosophies, the guide in the conscious being, Chaitya Guru or Andaryamin, the absolute of the thinker, the unknowable of the agnostic, the universal force of the materialist, the supreme soul and the supreme Shakti, the one who is differently named and imaged by the religions is the master of our yoga. The entire existence is one thing, not a multiplicity. There is a existential, multi, uh, there is a multiplicity in existence. Behind it, there is this oneness, this divine being, the conscious force behind it, co conscious presence behind it the fundamental foundational source which has been recognized in different ways by different time periods, different civilizations. So here he is listing some. The guide in the conscious being in Sanskrit referred to as the Chaitya Guru or Andaryamin, the inner guide. Or the absolute of the thinker, the philosophers had been pointing at that source as the absolute. 
the unknowable of the agnostic. Agnostic thinkers, seers, they would refer to it as the unknowable, the universal force of the materialist. Even our material science, it looks behind matter and recognizes the energy that cannot be created nor destroyed. It can be shaped from one form to another. And behind that energy, one conscious force. So even our modern science is heading in that direction of the universal force of the materialist. The supreme soul of and the supreme shakti. That's another way to see the supreme soul of the universe or the supreme shakti, the conscious force of the tantrics, the shakti. So if materialism looks at the force that is creating the universe as a mechanical force, the spiritual traditions, the tantric tradition would look at the force as a conscious force, shakti. The one who is differently named and imaged by the religions. The one, capital O, one, who is differently named and imaged by the religions. Every religion in the world have attempted to name and image that source. In India, India in particular, with so many branches, there had been endless conceptions of the divine source is the master of our yoga. So it is that one conscious existence, one being, that is the master of our yoga. This is a central secret we must know. It's not through our effort. It is the master of yoga presiding over the unfolding of our inner growth, our spiritual flowering, that makes everything possible. So, it's a beautiful line, let me read again. One who is the Lord or Ishura of the yogic philosophies, the guide in the conscious being, Chaitya Guru or Andaryamin, the absolute of the thinker, the unknowable of the agnostic, the universal force of the materialist, the supreme soul and the supreme shakti, the one who is differently named and imaged by the religions, is the master of our yoga. Beautiful. So with that, we are coming to the end of this episode. Number 37. I hope you are enjoying. I am really looking forward to see your comments, feedback, suggestions. Subscribe so that you get notification. And uh, thank you. See you next week.